uh, just because there's there's a lot to do. So welcome to week three of Revelation for the rest of us. Um, if you read ahead, um, which, you know, it's Thanksgiving week, I don't blame you if you didn't. Uh, we're looking at three cycles of judgment, three events that are prophesied from ascension to Christ's return. So we're looking at the seals, the bowls, and the trumpets. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that more in our outline. Our special topic today, we're going to encounter the word Armageddon. It only happens, the word only happens once in Revelation, but Armageddon is pictured four times. So that's our special topic. We'll get to that at the very end. Uh, good news, I remembered my Bible today, although I don't think I'm going to read much out of it. Um, but if, if you read ahead and you have questions about stuff, um, please, I don't know, get my attention. I'll try to answer it as briefly and quickly as I can move on. So, uh, just uh, a review of where we've been, and I know you over there are looking at that screen, and you're looking at that screen, but I'll do the best I can. Remember, we started out with John on the island of Patmos. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was worshiping, and all of a sudden, the Lord appears to him in a vision. Uh, the Son of Man surrounded by these golden lampstands. Remember, that's Jesus standing in the midst of his churches on earth. Um, he strengthens John, and he tells him to write. Write letters to the seven churches. Uh, back on the mainland, and he writes to them, he tells them what is going well in their congregation, what's not going well, and most importantly, what they need to do in order to overcome whatever temptation is getting in their go that, at that time, uh, so that they can share the promises in the end. After John has finished writing the letters, he's caught up into heaven to see a vision of the throne room of God. And there he sees uh, 24 elders and four living creatures surrounding the throne of God, worshiping him day and night, praising him for his work as creator. And then the second scene is a lamb looking as if it's been slain. Of course, this is Jesus. Uh, he alone is worthy to open the scroll of the prophecy uh, of what John is being told uh, or being shown that day. So the lamb comes in. He unravels that scroll, and so now we're to the part of Revelation that's a prophecy of the future. So if you're looking at your outline here, uh, after the inaugural vision, uh, this prophecy continues basically for the rest of the book. And today we're going to focus on three cycles, the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls that depict events that will happen between Christ's ascension into heaven and the day of his return. So they cover all of church history. We're skipping over this week this interlude of the book itself, kind of a pause that steps back and says, what's going on uh, behind the scenes of all this? It shows us the cosmic battle. We'll back up and look at that next week because it deserves a week in and of itself. Um, so that's kind of where we... We are in your outline if you're following along. Uh, today, I think you'll be good if you just follow along on Lesson 3 handout. So here is the scroll being opened. And even though, um, well, it's not really opened yet, the seals of the scroll pop off one by one. And each seal <coughs> reveals something uh, that's true of the future to come. And so it starts with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. How many of you have heard of these before? Yeah, yeah. Usually when we talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, people hear it like this. You know, one horse thunders, second horse thunders, third horse thunders, fourth horse thunders, and then the end. Like, they precede the apocalypse. But that's not how John means it. When he says the four horsemen of the apocalypse, it's just the four horsemen we find in St. John's apocalypse. And they don't just come at the end, preceding uh, Judgment Day, but they actually thunder throughout history. By the way, Dave Steinbacher, if you're out there, Dennis Fisher, it's not the Notre Dame backfield of 1924. <laughs> not those four horsemen. Different one. These four horsemen here. Uh, so you can kind of look up there if you want or look on your hand up. So the first horse that thunders out when the first seal explodes is a white horse. Uh, and he represents conquest. How do we know? Uh, he has a bow in his hand, symbolizing military might. Uh, he's given a crown. Notice he doesn't have a crown. He's given a crown, a symbol of victory. And this really represents man's, sinful man's, I should say, insatiable desire and penchant for acquiring power and often through tyrannical force. So throughout human history, um, men are going to be bent on conquest, conquering and often violently. By the way, if you look at Matthew 24 and the things Jesus says will happen in the end times, it parallels almost, not, not word for word, but thought for thought with 
these seals and the, and the judgments that come out of them. So that's, that's a neat study. In fact, you could, you could Google Matthew 24 and the seven seals and you'd see a chart that lays it out really nicely. Okay, um, how do people often conquer? The, the second horse is a red horse representing war. Uh, the red certainly symbolizes bloodshed there. And this rider is permitted, notice he doesn't have the authority, but he's permitted to take life by means of the sword. Um, so we can expect uh, the regularity of warfare in our world as we await Christ's return. Peace is the exception. We should be thankful when there's peace. But what does Jesus say? In Matthew 24, there are, in Mark 13, there will be wars and rumors of wars. So again, we're not reading these. By the way, I picked up a book by Billy Graham, Approaching Hoofbeats, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Um, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> but many people will think these four horsemen represent some future event that's going to happen way in the future, some certain war. We say, no, these are, these are patterns throughout history. And remember, it's not as if there's actually going to be a, a horse thundering through a war. When John sees these images, they're images that represent something else. So we constantly have to remind ourselves of that. These are not literal depictions of things to come. Um, they, they stand for something. The third horse is a black horse. He represents famine. How do we know? Well, black is the color uh, of death, certainly, but he has scales in his hand. His scales were used to measure food in antiquity. And so uh, here's a picture of famine. Uh, the wheat and the barley that's talked about when this horse thunders are about eight to ten times the normal price. Uh, it's a picture of starvation wages. Uh, a day's wage for one person to subsist on wheat, or if you get the cheap stuff, barley, maybe a family could subsist. subsist. But that's, that's all they could do. And certainly uh, we know that in any time and place in our world, uh, famine is a problem. There are food shortages. Um, it's part of what living in a fallen world's like. By the way, I, I neglected to say, these first seven seals, these are going to picture mostly the suffering human beings cause one another. Okay? That's the focus. So if we go through this cycle of history three times, and each time something else is being emphasized. And what's being emphasized here is that sinful human beings cause harm to one another uh, through our actions. Okay? Finally, the, the fourth horse thunders out. Uh, he's a pale horse. Um, some, some translations will say a green horse. Whatever the word color used there, it's the color of a corpse. Okay? So it's pretty, pretty you know, it, it says he's death and Hades is his name. And he's given authority, again, to kill. Authority over one-fourth to kill. All right? So that doesn't mean 25% of the world's going to die at some particular event in world history. It just uh, what, what you're going to see here is... This is, there's a, a, a fourth are killed, and then when we get to the, the bull or the, the trumpets later, uh, a third are going to be killed, and then when we get to the bulls, every person's going to be killed. And so each time we go through this history, there's an intensification and an acceleration, kind of hearkening to the end, that, that, that things are getting worse as we approach the end times. So there's a progression there that plays out. Um, so again, a fourth is significant, but not, you know, a lot, a third is a little more than that, and of course, every is total destruction. Then we get to the fifth seal, and John sees something completely different, not four horses, but he sees these saints under the altar, and these, uh, there are ones who have been killed, their blood has been shed by their witness to the Lord, and they're crying out to God, how long until you will avenge our blood? Their prayer is hugely important because basically the whole rest of the prophecy is waiting for their prayer to be answered. Now remember, John is writing to people facing persecution. They might face the same end of these martyrs do. They might have to give their life for the gospel. And they're wondering, when is the payoff? How long? And God tells these martyrs here, just wait. There's more who are going to die for the faith. And the full number of martyrs has come in then the end will come. And so he gives them white robes and he tells them, be patient. Um, we'll, we'll, their prayers will pop up again and again as we go throughout the next several weeks. Finally then, we have the sixth seal and it pictures a tragic end of the world. Okay, now it's a little different here because the end of the world is depicted again with the seventh trumpet and again with the seventh bowl that we'll get to, but here it's the sixth seal. So it's not a one-for-one -one correlation. <laughs> Uh, but we see all these atmospheric events. 
uh, that coincide with all the kind, all the descriptions of Judgment Day, from the prophets to the minor prophets to Jesus. Um, we see these great signs in the sky that depict a Judgment Day in the end. And here we know it's a tragic picture of the end of the world because unbelievers are trying to hide from God's judgment. And they're crying out to the rocks, fall on us, crush us, because they would rather be crushed by rocks falling off a mountain than they would face the wrath of Jesus. Okay, Where does that picture come from? Uh, Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah pictures Judgment Day the same way. Okay, And I'm not often going to be able to stop and allude to the places in the Old Testament, but once again, remember all these images are borrowing from the Old Testament. John is recycling images and giving them fresh and new meaning. For instance, in Zechariah, there are horsemen of different color from Zechariah chapter 1. And so uh, you could spend your whole life studying how John uses the Old Testament, um, and it'd be a worthy thing, but we can't get into that uh, all today. All right, now before the seventh seal comes, we have what I'll call an interlude or an interruption. Now here's what I want to point out here. Um, this happens again with the trumpets, not with the bowls. But notice, this is just the amount of text spent on each. Notice how the interruptions between the sixth and the seventh in the series contain just as much information and detailed information as the rest of them. They're not just little interruptions, they're big. And so they only get like four lines in your outline. But honestly, we could probably spend an entire extra lesson on each of these interludes. But what happens here is, uh, amidst all this judgment, we pause, and that's where John wants us to focus. Not on the doom and gloom going on, not on the war and the famine and the bloodshed, but on what God is doing in the midst of all this. Okay, and this interlude shows us that in the midst of persecution, God's people are protected. Uh, when the rocks, when the people were crying out for the rocks to fall on them, they said, who can stand in the day of judgment? And John sees a vision showing him, here's who can stand. And he sees two images. He sees, um, he sees a uh, uh, 144,000 who are sealed on earth. All right? The, uh, we talk about numbers being symbolic. Uh, 12 times 12 is 144. 10 cubed is 1,000. You multiply those together, 144,000. This is... John's saying that the entire Old and New Testament church are sealed, protected uh, by God. And we see this as a picture of the church militant. The church on earth below, who's still fighting the good fight of the faith, still fighting the battle of the soul. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Some of you will get that joke. Um, but God is protecting us in the midst from the enemy, okay? In the midst of all this persecution and suffering, evil humans being cause each other, God is protected. And what is the end of the 144,000 should they hang on? Next, John looks and he sees a great multitude that no one can count. That's the church triumphant. The church already exalted at the Lamb's right hand in heaven, now resting from their labors. They're singing the Te Deum, that hymn that we began to hear sung last week. It appears again here with a new verse. Of course, this is the pericope we read every Sunday on All Saints Sunday. Uh, how fitting in the midst of our world uh, where everything seems kind of crazy uh, that we know what the ultimate destination and end of the saints is. They're, they're in white robes. They're, they're with God. Their robes have been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. So that's the, the interlude John gives us before we rush then to the seventh seal. So in the seventh seal, there's silence in heaven for a half an hour. Uh, it allows John to kind of sort of process and take in the things he's seen before the trumpets begin to sound and their judgments commence. Um, also, um, we see, uh, if you look at 8.5, uh, the angel, the angel takes the censer and fills it with fire from the altar and throws it on the earth. And there are peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and earthquake. Um, remember, the saints were praying uh, around the altar. And here again, in 8, 1 through 5, the saints are praying again. And in answer to their prayers, the angel throws these fire judgments down to the earth uh, as a way to hasten the answering of their prayers. And so what you'll see is the first four trumpets are going to have some image of fire involved with them. The judgments come from the, the throne room 
of God, and they're part of God's answer in prayer. Okay? So next then comes a second cycle of seven. Uh, these are pictured as trumpets, and remember in Scripture, trumpets are not just good music, but they announce judgment, they warn, they alert people. And here that's what they're doing. They're announcing God's judgments using fallen creation. So here is not so much a picture of suffering human beings cause each other, but how God uses a fallen world as an instrument of his judgment. Okay? And again, it's going to be tempting to want to take these images literally, um, but you get into all kinds of trouble if you do that, because many of them couldn't possibly be literal. And so we have to think, what, what is this representing? What is this showing us about uh, what what's happens in our world? So the first trumpet sounds, and I think I just have you yeah, here. Um, the first trumpet sounds and hail and fire mixed with blood fall down to the earth and a third of the vegetation is ruined. Remember, earlier the fraction was a quarter, here it's a third. Um, again, the first three trumpets involve fire. Uh, so what is this it's telling us? Well, in the first seal, warfare destroyed the land. Here, uh, natural elements cause destruction. What, what we learn from this trumpet is at any given time, uh, the earth's yield is going to be diminished because of its fallenness. So it's amazing that with modern technology, we can feed the amount of people that inhabit this earth, and yet uh, the truth is there's still blight, there's still devastation, there's still drought, there's still famine. Uh, the second trumpet sounds, and a large mountain uh, burning with fire is cast into a sea. And a third of the sea becomes blood, and a third of the creatures perish, and a third of the ships are destroyed. Uh, here we see uh, that creation is affected as well as human commerce. So when the earth suffers, uh, humans' ability to carry out their business on the earth suffers as well. Okay, So even though the focus here is on creation, humans are still affected by that. And the purpose of these plagues, um, at least at this point, is not primarily retribution, uh, but re repentance. When things go wrong in our world, when the Tower of Siloam falls, when a man is born blind, what does Jesus say? Uh, don't worry about why, but when you see these things, you repent. Right? And so when we see destruction in our world, or the world struggling and groaning under the weight of the fall, it's a call to repentance. The third trumpet is a, a burning star called Wormwood, which just means bitter, uh, falls, and a third of the fresh water is made bitter. Uh, a reminder that throughout these latter days, uh, a portion of the world's fresh water will be non-potable, many will die. You know, one of the biggest problems around the world is uh, having access to fresh water. Uh, a remarkable amount of our world's population does not have ready access to fresh, clean water for, for drinking and stuff in a given day. Um, so again, maybe we don't identify with, with how creation suffered. We, we shield that through our, our technology and our abundance here in this nation. but. Uh, what's true around the world is that these things uh, are, are prevalent. The fourth trumpet, uh, a third of the sun, moon, and stars are darkened, and a third of the day is darkened. Now, oftentimes people will try to say, well, what could this represent? Is this uh, the pollution we cause and it's causing smog, or, or, or you know, what's going on? Uh, it, it's really difficult to try to picture this in a literal manner. Um, but it shows that nature and its components are struck, and, and humanity uh, suffers from it. Um, and that's really all that it's trying to depict there. Uh, and then something different happens in the third trumpet. There's another element here. An eagle of, uh, is flying in mid-heaven and says, Woe, woe, woe. He announces three woes. And these woes signal transition from uh, natural disasters being uh, depicted, sort of worldly things uh, being struck to otherworldly activity. All right, and the fifth trumpet is just... The fifth and sixth trumpet are just uh, crazy. Uh, they're very long if you read them. They have sensational imagery. Uh, star uh, falls from the sky and is given the key to the abyss. Uh, Abaddon or Apollonon, that this means a destroyer in Greek and Hebrew. Uh, that's Satan, falls from the sky and unleashes uh, from the abyss uh, these demon locust-like creatures. Uh, again, not literal here. <laughs> so what do they what do they do? They create darkness over all the earth. And they torment believers, or sorry, unbelievers. 
uh, the believers are actually protected from what they're doing. So you have to step back and think to yourself, what is this awful, otherworldly scene depicting? When John sees this, what is he telling us about what's going to happen on the earth? Well, uh, Satan's forces are going to usher in spiritual darkness. And they're going to torment unbelievers, not those who are sealed uh, by the faith and believe, but they're, they're going to take over the hearts and minds of those who don't believe, who are led astray by Satan and the destroyer. Uh, that's the first woe. Uh, the six trumpet sounds, and we see a picture of, of the second woe. And here we see a picture of angels um, who are bound at the Euphrates. These, these angels who are going to bring God's judgment, they're being held back, and all of a sudden they're released at the exact right time. And 200 million uh, horse-like creatures, uh, like a cavalry, like a demonic cavalry, assemble and bring a third of the humans to, to death. Uh, this is a preview of the final battle at Armageddon that we're going to see again, and I'm going to talk more about that at the end. But I think the point to, to point out here is, um, if you look at uh, the end of the sixth trumpet here, let's just, uh, I would like you to see this in your, in your Bible. Um, uh, 9 verse 20. 9 verse 20 if you're looking. So after all these horrible things happen in our world and our witness, it says the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which cannot see or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So you see God is using these things to bring repentance but many men's hearts are just hardened by them. Kind of like Pharaoh's heart was hardened by the plagues. They didn't change Pharaoh's mind, right? They just further sealed him in his opposition to God and his people. Uh, so that's what's, what's going on there. Uh, men refuse to repent, which is a picture of what's to come. But then, again, we see an interlude before the seventh trumpet. Uh, here again are two visions, which we could probably spend an entire Bible study on each of them. Uh, one is an angel surrounded by a rainbow and holding a scroll in his hand. Uh, the other are these two witnesses who look like uh, lampstands and olive trees. So what does this represent? Well, uh, again, I hope you're following in your outline. The angel with the scroll um, stands on the land of the sea. He has one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. He has dominion over all the earth. He's encloaked in a cloud and a rainbow. A cloud is often represents God's presence, and a rainbow, of course, represents his promises. And this angel says, Behold, there will be no more delay. And who's he talking to there? He's talking to the saints under the altar who are crying out, How long until you avenge your blood? He says, Ah, the end is upon us. It's time. Um, meanwhile, while John is seeing this vision, he hears seven thunders. And the angel says, Don't write down the seven thunders. Man doesn't even know about it. Kind of like when Paul in Corinthians was caught up into the seventh heaven or wherever he was, and God says, but you can't tell anyone what you saw. These seven thunders are a mystery, but if you think about it, we had a fourth, a third, next we're going to get every in our progression. What would naturally come next? A half, right? And a half is, is skipped over. Probably because of what God realizes is that the suffering in the world is not bringing the nations to repentance. So one more cycle isn't going to matter, right? We're just delaying things for the saints who need their redemption, for shedding their blood for Jesus. So we thunder forward. Okay, so John, like Ezekiel, uh, eats a scroll that's in the angel's hand, and he says it tastes sweet, just like Ezekiel ate God's word, and it tastes sweet. Um, but the judgments that he's going to prophesy are a bitter pill to swallow. So He's told to grab this scroll out of the angel's hand, digest it, and proclaim that word to the people. And he says, it was a sweet word, but it was bitter in my stomach because of the judgments I'm going to proclaim. Uh, then we have these two witnesses who can do things like raise the dead and send down balls of fire and stuff like that. Uh, everything these witnesses can do is something Moses and Elijah have already done in Scripture. So they're patterned after Moses and Elijah, the prophetic witness of the church. And John is told to measure a temple he sees. 
Uh, Ezekiel was also told to measure a temple. And, and what are you doing when you measure a temple? You're saying, I know the boundaries of it, right? And who are the temple of God? The people of God are being built into a living temple. And so in Ezekiel's vision and in John's vision that he's borrowing, uh, this says God is going to protect his church. And then these two witnesses, again, uh, the, the images of olive trees and lampstands come from Zechariah chapter 4. Uh, they have all this authority. Uh, and what happens, though, is as they prophesy, they are eventually killed. And then they rise up. So what are these images showing us in the midst of these trumpet woes that in the midst of the persecution and the fallenness of our world, God's word will continue to be proclaimed? Right? John is proclaiming God's word. These two witnesses patterned after Moses and Elijah are proclaiming his word. The word continues to go out in the midst of all that's going on around us. Here's another little image of the temple and the Witnesses. And we get to the, the seventh trumpet, and here we see another picture of the end of the world. This time, though, it's a joyful end of the world. Loud voices praise God, 24 elders sing. Uh, another stanza of the Te Deum, this is that Lauren, the, the lamb that has, has begun his reign, right? You know, we're singing this is the feast, the lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Uh, the temple of heaven is opened, they see the Ark of the Covenant. And everybody worshiping the Lord. Uh, and then again, uh, lightning, thunder, and earthquake, and hail. And this parallels the sixth seal. This is the second time we see the depiction of the world ending. But this time it's joyful. It's from the perspective of the believers. Now remember that angel announced three woes. The first woe was the fifth trumpet, that the demon locusts. <laughs> The, the second woe was the sixth trumpet. That was that uh, demonic cavalry assembled for battle. Some people say the, the third woe would be this seventh trumpet, but um, it doesn't seem very woeful described. Actually, if you look, uh, flip ahead in your Bible to something we'll cover next week, look at 12.7, uh, 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 verse 12.7. Actually, no, I want 12.12. 12. Uh, Therefore rejoice, O heavens and earth, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you. Woe to you. That's the only other time the word woe is used in Scripture. So probably the third woe is delayed until what we're going to talk about next week, when the devil comes down to make war against the church on earth. So just a little prelude of what's to come. Um, all right, so how are we doing? Oh my goodness, 17 minutes to go. All right, flip your page over. Um, again, we're skipping over chapters 12 through 14. They will get uh, treatment next week. Next week's probably the key lesson in the whole thing. I'm not trying to bend your arm to come if you're already bored out of your mind, but um, we'll learn a lot next week about what's really going on behind the scenes. Uh, but for the sake of treating these three cycles of seven together, we're going to look now at the bowls. Uh, the bowls uh, show God executing his final judgment on evil. And like, like the trumpets, they employ a lot of imagery from the plagues of Exodus, only here it's even more um, overt in what it's done. So, um, by the way, 2 Thessalonians 1, uh, 7 through 9 kind of kind of pictures this moment at the end. It, it says, since indeed God considers it just to replay a fiction with affliction, those who afflict you, and grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well to, to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified with his saints, and to be marveled at among all who believe, because our testimony to you was believed. But again, this idea of inflicting uh, the judgments of God and the, the suffering of eternal destruction, that's what these angels who are ready to pour out these bowls uh, are doing. They're pouring out God's judgment. So uh, in 15, 1 through 8, uh, I'm on my outline again, if you're looking with me. Uh, it says there's a third and final sign in heaven. 
Uh, the first two signs were a woman and a dragon. We'll learn about next week. Now is a third sign. And what that signals is that this conflict between the church and Satan is about to come to an end. And this one is called the great and marvelous sign. And so John sees a battlefield of a war between Satan and the church. Uh, remember that turbulent sea that's, or that, 